This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from Aperoa's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to EVs in Aperoa. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup of news from the world of clean cars and green energy. Thanks for joining me. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that I actually filmed this show a day earlier than normal because of an urgent appointment I couldn't shift last minute. This means I may have missed some late breaking stories from this week and I will do my best to cover them next week. Additionally, given the US news cycle now, it's kind of hard to keep up with the chaos over there, which leads very nicely into our first story of today, namely that ongoing crisis in the USA as its president, Donald Trump, continues his frankly scary barrage of threats and executive orders that are having an impact on the global auto industry. Just as we were preparing to publish last week's show, President Trump announced a 25% import tariff on products from Canada and Mexico, as well as a 15% tariff on products from China. And while we were editing this show, President Trump's Federal Highway Administration issued an immediate hold on the release of any funds already allocated to the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, or NEVI, program, which is as much as $5 billion US dollars, money that's already been allocated and I should point out under federal law cannot be withheld after allocation. Doing so is patently illegal. We're sneaking this piece of news into the show during post-production, but it's already leading to incredible uncertainty in the EV industry. And having visited multiple vandalized fast charging stations yesterday, I think things are going to get a whole lot worse for US EV drivers. While tariffs on Canadian and Mexican products have been pushed back a month, one of Canada's immediate responses was to announce its own tariff on US-made vehicles, including EVs. While these tariffs are on hold for about another three weeks, the US's trade war is already causing ripples throughout the clean transportation and energy community. Most US automakers have strong, symbiotic relationship with parts suppliers and production facilities in both Canada and Mexico, and it's fairly common for vehicle parts to be assembled in one country before then being shipped to another for final assembly. While this is going to impact companies with US facilities, if it actually comes to pass, any losses that will happen as a consequence will impact global company bottom lines and possibly future EV production plans around the world. Watch this space. Off the back of that story, GM, which makes many of its electric models over the border in Mexico, announced this week that it will be cancelling a third shift at one of its EV production plants. Its Ramos Arispe assembly plant, where the Chevrolet Blazer EV, Chevrolet Equinox EV, Cadillac Optique and Honda Prolog are all made, has been operating a three-shift-a-day schedule for some time, effectively churning out EVs 24-7. But now it appears that both Honda and GM are nervous about EV demand in the US if promised federal incentive cuts take place, and the production facility has now returned to operating a two-shift-per-day schedule. Honda appears to have made the decision to cut the Prologue output first, with GM adjusting its production plans shortly thereafter. Given that both Honda's Prologue EV and the Chevy Equinox EV were sales successes last year, it's a sad but unfortunately predictable move from automakers that we had hoped would stand up a little more forcefully to the current White House's attempts to push back EV adoption levels at a precipitous clip. The promise of a trade war? That feels like just a punch in the gut. I promise we do have some good news in today's show, but first, another nail in the metaphorical coffin of EV choice in the US, namely that Kia has confirmed it will not bring the EV5 to the States. Confirmed this week, it says it will debut the EV5 at the Canadian International Auto Show on Valentine's Day, but as confirmed, the mid-size, low-cost EV won't come to the US. Due to go on sale in Canada later this year, complete with Nax charging inlet as standard, Kia hasn't confirmed the reasons for the decision not to bring the car to the US, but it's worth noting this isn't the first time it's decided not to sell a model available in Canada south of the border. While the original 
original first-generation Kia Soul EV was available in the US, when the model was given a second-generation refresh around 2020, Kia decided to make it a Canadian-only model, leaving US buyers at the time with only one EV choice from the brand, the Kia e Nero. While Kia now has more choice in the US EV market, thanks to the e Nero, EV6 and EV9, it's not difficult to imagine that political uncertainty was partly to blame for this decision. Just before the tail end of last year, we told you about rumours that Honda and Nissan were considering a new merger to work on vehicles together, rumours that were later confirmed by both firms as being the very early stages of negotiation. At the time, I remember noting that such a merger wasn't a foregone conclusion, and this week, well, it appears I was right. Multiple news outlets now report that the future of the proposed merger is very uncertain. Last week, we learned that Mitsubishi wasn't interested in joining its two partners, preferring to stay independent instead. And this week, we learned that the merger talks are now in tatters, allegedly because Honda wanted to make Nissan its subsidiary instead of establishing a new joint holding company that both firms had control over. That solution would have forced Nissan to lose all control of its own brand, something its board was very unhappy about. Thus, the talks fell through. But it's worth noting that not all hope is lost and we might see progress on a merger. But the message from Nissan right now seems to be that Honda's current proposals are untenable for the brand. From Nissan to its partner company Renault now, and a new single-seat electric vehicle that Renault says will help it achieve a new efficiency record. Enter the Renault Falante Record 2025, a car that Renault is calling a demo car and laboratory on wheels for electric efficiency. Renault says its design was inspired by two concept aerodynamic vehicles from the 20s and the 50s, and as such, you can certainly see some of those design influences. Fully drive-by-wire, this functional prototype is fitted with the same 87 kilowatt hour battery pack that's found in the production Renault Scenic E-Tech, but it weighs just 1,000 kilograms, around 2,205 pounds. That's nearly one half of the donor vehicle's total unladen weight. As you might expect, the weight savings come from some pretty extreme design choices, such as a canvas-style hammock seat, 3D printed everything and super efficient wheels. Renault says the car will attempt a range record later this year. Ford published its fourth quarter and year-end financials at the end of business on Wednesday, posting its highest ever revenue at 185 billion US dollars. It beat Wall Street expectations in the fourth quarter, posting 48.2 billion instead of the 43 billion expected, which was up 2.2 billion year over year. However, Ford's EV division, Model E, lost the company just under $5.1 billion, which was more than the $4.7 billion loss from the previous year. Ford blamed the increased losses on pricing pressure and predicted it will suffer similar EV-related losses this year, partly down to the specter of tariffs in the US and the removal of US federal tax credits for EVs. Despite these losses, Ford's overall figures deep beat expectations and Ford CEO Jim Farley stated that the company is becoming quote-unquote fundamentally stronger. That said, Ford stock fell five percentage points at the end of the day following the release of these figures. For a while now, Audi has operated a naming convention for its vehicles that has followed the odd even methodology. All models with an odd number were internal combustion engine ones, while even numbers were EVs. While most consumers may not even know that fact, Audi says it's now changing its naming convention again, using numbers as an indicant of size and instead relying on suffixes to denote drivetrain type. Its quoted press release example suggests that there might be an Audi A6 Avant TSFI, which is the code for its gasoline engine variant, and an Audi A6 Avant e 
Omicron, uh, the EV variant. And given that Audi has said in its press release that these name changes will only be used for brand new models and existing versions will keep their existing names, it certainly seems to suggest it's less focused on making its brand all electric as it once was and that internal combustion engine variants either are already planned for future production or are at least being considered. Frankly, it feels like we're going to see much more of this in 2025 than we might like. Talking of which, Ford, like so many other automakers, now seems to be looking towards an alternative to pure battery electric vehicles for future lineups. As reported this week by multiple outlets, including Bloomberg, Ford is now looking to add new range extended full size pickup and SUV models to its portfolio. Although Ford hasn't shown any signs of cancelling its Lightning family, it seems the promise of plug-in hybrid pickup trucks from rival firms Stellantis-owned Ram and Volkswagen-owned startup Scout Motors has got Ford thinking about its own range-extended variant. While those who have tried the F-150 Lightning are generally pretty positive, and we've proven before on this channel that it's capable of towing long distance with some mindful route planning, the Lightning is only a small proportion of Ford's overall F-150 Mark sales. And if Ford is serious about transitioning away from combustion-only variants, a range-extended model may encourage more people to plug in. But as we've noted many times before, range-extended and plug-in hybrids add extra cost and complexity that the majority of people don't actually need for daily driving. Despite what certain governments and their deep-pocketed donors might want us to believe, the key to reducing the effects of anthropogenic climate change is to reduce emissions around the world. That means replacing heavily polluting transportation options with cleaner, greener alternatives, like affordable, reliable mass transportation, encouraging the use of micromobility and developing walkable cities. This week, new data from the International Council on Clean Transportation suggests that the effect of all of the above, especially the global transition to EVs, will now mean that we're on track to hit peak global transportation emissions 25 years ahead of what was previously feared. It suggests that unless there is a dramatic change in EV adoption around the world, <clears throat> 2025 may represent our peak global transportation emissions, with approximately 9 gigawatts tons of CO2 released this year, falling to 7.1 gigatons per year by 2050. And to finish this section, let's carry on the good news with news from New York State in the US, where despite Donald Trump's attempts to end the deployment of future wind and solar projects, the state's newest, largest solar farm is good to go. Midweek, the New York Office of Renewable Energy Siting and Transportation, otherwise known as ORES, officially gave Greenbacker Renewable Energy the permission required to finish building a 500 megawatt cider solar farm originally designed by Hector Energy. Sited on 2,500 acres east of Buffalo, the site is already under construction and is due to be completed and generating power for the local grid sometime next year. Funded to the tune of $950 million US dollars, it's part of a larger push from the state of New York to source 70% of all of its electricity from renewable energy and clean generation methods by 2030. Before we get to the last two stories, I have a question. Are you in the market for a new EV? Because if you are and you live in Aotearoa, you should totally check out our very own buyer's guide at ecotricity.co.nz. It is packed with tons of information that you'll need to pick a car that's right for you and includes plenty of details about available vehicles, daily life with an EV, how to file and pay those pesky RUCs and so much more. So follow the link below and start your journey today. If you've spent any time talking to prospective EV owners, one of the biggest fears about making the switch is the terrifying spectre of range anxiety. And that you'll simply find yourself with not enough charge to make it home. We, and many other folks, have done our best to dispel that myth over the years, but now there's a new way to counter the FUD, cold, hard data. Thanks to Ford Mustang Mark E chief engineer Donna Dixon, who, by the way, is awesome, we now know that the average Mustang Mark E driver 
does about 66 miles, 106 kilometers of typical driving on a workday. Well, that's more than the 40 miles or 64 kilometers that the U.S. government says the average U.S. citizen drives in a day. It's a long way from the Mustang Mark E's total claimed EPA range. Now, I should acknowledge that if you don't have at-home charging, that will likely translate to multiple trips to a charging station away from home every week. But even then, the savings over petrol should make up for that. But I am really curious, how far do you drive in a day if you own an EV? Let us know below. And finally, while many think of Polestar as a Chinese brand, its spiritual home has always been Sweden, thanks to Polestar's historical place as Volvo's performance mark, complete with a long heritage in motorsport. This week, in honour of that, Polestar unveiled a new collection of specially prepared rally-inspired models that pay full homage to that heritage, the Polestar 2, 3 and 5 Arctic Circle, making their debut at the 2025 Fat Ice Race in Zell MC, Austria, these three rally-ready models feature lifted suspension, strut braces, quad pro LED front spotlights and Recaro seats, not to mention OZ racing rally wheels and suitable studded ice tyres for traction. At sideways fun, of course, on the slickest of ice tracks. While Polestar doesn't appear to be readying these for sale, they certainly look the part in matching body wraps and frankly, I think if they were put into production, they would sell. But then I also really like the Ford Mustang Mark E Rally for the very same reasons. You know, you can take the Brit out of the UK, but you cannot remove my love of a good bit of rally fun. And on that note, we are done for the day. Before I go, though, do make sure you've hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on the latest in EV news from the channel. And of course, if you haven't yet, it's high time you switch to Aotearoa's first and only climate positive certified renewable electricity provider. It's super easy to make that switch. And in doing so, you'll help the nation wean itself off dirty energy and onto clean green power that will keep the land beautiful for generations to come. I'll be back next week. But in the meantime, do check out the lovely Gavin Kiwi EV Shoebridge offerings on this very same channel. He's always doing something fun. So make sure that you watch and that you also hit subscribe. So thanks for joining me. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Kakite! See you next time.